Well, I want to welcome you to our webinar this evening. It is part of the Waypoint 55 webinar series where we provide a monthly webinar to leaders, uh, church leaders around the region uh, on a variety of topics that are faith-based that help you be better leaders. And today we have a fairly unique topic, and I'm just kind of thankful that it's a topic that's not related necessarily uh, to the coronavirus and all the restrictions and implications of that. We've been talking about that ad nauseum for the last three weeks or so, and we will continue to do so probably for the next month, two months, three months, we don't know how long. But tonight we're back to our regular webinar series, and uh, this one is about local politics and the local church. And we're not talking about national politics at all, but local politics and how the church can have an appropriate uh, position of influence and connection uh, to the, the local political scene and how that works. And so we want to welcome you to our webinar. If this is your first time on one, one of our webinars, I want to tell you a couple things before we get started. First of all, as we always do, we want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, who is the sponsor of our webinar series and has been since we started more than three years ago. And so we want to thank them for their partnership uh, to have this webinar series every month for the last three years. And then very recently, we're having pop-up 35-minute webinars on these uh, very timely topics that have come up over the last uh, couple of weeks. But we want to thank what, um, Mac U for being our a partner in providing these webinars to you for elders and mission teams and prayer teams and uh, first impressions and guest services teams and a number of topics like that. And so, uh, uh, Waypoint exists to come alongside churches and leaders and help them navigate ministry together. And, uh, and so we want to talk about an, an area that I think uh, a lot of churches are afraid to talk about that over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so in my adult lifetime, it's come to where we've, we've kind of, it seems like we've bought into the belief that the church needs to stay out of politics. And, uh, and that church leaders are hesitant to have any kind of connection to politics for a variety of reasons. And so hopefully we can talk about that a little bit. I was thinking about this when, when I first asked Neil uh, to be our panelist tonight, that it's interesting that when you think about from cover to cover in scripture, how many of God's people did have influence o over uh, country's leaders. Uh, from Joseph in Egypt uh, to most of the prophets had the ear of the king. Uh, and then even in the, in the New Testament, you see the Apostle Paul, for example, uh, as he is going on all these trials, interfacing with Festus and Felix and others along his journey, that New Old Testament and New Testament alike, Christian leaders were interfacing with the, the government officials. And so, um, so there's precedent for that. I know uh, Neil's going to uh, talk about that. But before we get started, uh, uh, what I want to do, first of all, is uh, take an attendance. Uh, I want to drive a poll right now, just asking how many people are on your computer tonight. We always like to tell Mid-Atlantic Christian University how many people, rather than how many computers, we have on our screens. Last year, we had 588 people join one of our 12 monthly webinars. And so, uh, so we're going to ask that of you tonight as well. <clears throat> If you would go ahead and, and uh, sign in, we're about two thirds of the way through there. <clears throat> and also while uh, we're filling that out, I'll tell you at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q and A button. And that's obviously for question and answer. And, and I wanna invite you, as soon as you have a question that comes to mind, if you would press that button, type in your question then and not save it for later, you, you might forget. And that gets into a queue that we can see and try and answer either uh, at our next natural spot to try and answer that or at the end, but also goes into a queue that if we don't get to answer it live, we're able to answer your question via email uh, after the fact. Within the next day, uh, at worst, we will we will get back with you with, it, with an answer to your question. So you can use the Q&A button to ask a question. There'll also be a follow-up email that will uh, be generated tomorrow that you'll receive that if there's any resources that we can provide uh, to you, uh, we'll include that in the, the text box that we're allowed to customize in the follow-up email that's generated by the Zoom platform. All right, so um, so we have got the attendance. I'm going to end that poll right there. And then uh, we are going to move uh, into uh, Neil. Neil and I have been friends for uh, almost 15 years, and I got the pleasure and honor to perform his wedding ceremony 
13 years ago? I'm 13 trying to remember years how October, long it's yeah. been. So 15 years? 13, 13 years uh -huh. in October. Yeah, you should know better than I. Uh, 13 years coming up. And uh, and I was really uh, surprised when Neil told me last year that he was running for office. And he's not a career politician. This was his first foray into politics and local politics. And so I have been um, chatting with him uh, periodically throughout the whole process of campaigning and election and just fascinated personally about the political science of all the local election process and uh, politics. And uh, but now that he's been in office for a grand total of three months, he started three months ago, first week of January. And uh, so uh, he has learned a lot in 90 days in office in uh, just a very calm season where nothing's going on in the news. Uh, and uh, he, he jumped right into it. So Neil, if you would introduce yourself and kind of tell us your story, the genesis of how you got to where you are and then how you got into politics in the first place last year. Yeah, I don't think anybody was more surprised than my wife, uh, who this is the furthest thing from her, if you knew her personality, but um, I've always been interested in politics. My grandfather was in the school board for 12 years growing up. And I just, I remember being at the dinner table and he would take a phone call and I would hear him talking to somebody and helping people. And he was, he, he, got, he was really known for going to bat for people, especially people um, that needed the help and didn't have the means. And, you know, when I went in, in fifth grade, if you look at my memory book, it had uh, the future plans were just to be president of the United States or prime minister of England. Um, I was born in England and I thought, well, I'll have two options, a double chance to get there. My first uh, foray in college, uh, when I went to the University of Pittsburgh out, right out of high school, I was actually a political science major. I thought I'd be a lawyer and then um, potentially go to politics, but I really didn't like school. So um, I actually ran out of money after that first year and uh, joined the Marine Corps. Saw a lot about leadership and uh, I've always been attracted to good leaders. And I, uh, I decided that, you know, I would do my foray. Politics wasn't going to be for me. So I, I started working at Capital One and I moved to Virginia. I grew up in Northeast PA, a blue collar family, uh, very much paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I did uh, join the Marine Corps, went over to uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Um, I had really no faith background growing up. I was an atheist slash agnostic for my thir first 30 years. And then the Alpha Course wound up being a big part of my faith story. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because if you know anything about the Alpha Course, it's about asking questions and getting to truth. And that fascinated me. Um, after uh, 20 years at Capital One, um, my wife, uh, had she had started a business uh, probably around year 13, 14 for me, but uh, two years ago, it started to really expand. She had started an advertising agency, and it just got to where it was way beyond her. Uh, I was doing process management and um, good at going into organizations and making things work, and I, uh, she asked me, um, I was traveling a lot. I had teams in the Philippines, Central America, all over the U.S., and it was just, it was getting wearisome, and 20 years of doing anything is just a lot. So she asked me if I would come and work for her for six months and get, get the business to be scalable, and I did, and we really worked well together, and I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I worked myself out of a job of sorts, so I had all this time on my hands, and I had, uh, I, I became a CASA volunteer, which is extremely rewarding, and they're a great organization, but um, I had also Explain the CASA volunteer. That's the what's CASA stand for? I'm sorry, court court appointed special advocate. So CASA okay. is a volunteer position that when um, children are in the court system and there's issues of either abuse or neglect, I uh, I go in and I advocate for the children and I'm the eyes and the ears of the judge. So I get all the records, I could talk to anybody, it's like an investigation. Um, and then I would give a report to the judge at the end, it's, it's the children are my clients, not the parents or grandparents or the other adults in the picture. But just again, that feeling of service and uh, I love the word advocate and you can't really, I've, I've, well, it's not on this one. But um, my, my slogan was, I'm your advocate, not your politician. 
So I was working with Brennan and I had an affinity sort of, of getting things done. And uh, the current supervisor approached me and said, hey, you ought to think about running. And I said, absolutely not. And then he said, well, can I at least appoint you to a board? So she, he appointed me to a board that had to do with zoning. And you would think, so I had to go, I, I went and got certified in zoning. And it's exactly as exciting as it sounds. Um, but it was very <laughs> fascinating to me to figure out how do you get a whole bunch of humans that have very different ideas, very different ideals, different backgrounds, to live together and to, to move forward and be successful. Um, and I really got the bug. And then we started praying about it. And um, Brennan really wasn't a big fan of it. Um, and then God really affirmed that for me that, you know, you're, you're supposed to run for office. So I did. And here I am. Oh, and I did win. Right. I didn't just run. I, I won. <laughs> That's right. Barely. So I, close, I didn't say I did win. <laughs> When I introduce you, I, for those of you who don't know Goochland County, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, Goochland County is the first county west of, of uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Metro Richmond. And so it's a rural county uh, outside of the metro area of Richmond. And uh, so you've lived there and commuted into, into Richmond, Cap One, mm -hmm. when, you were, when you were there. So, um, so, um, so tell us about uh, quickly, um, I, I know you've, I know you, where you want to head with this, but uh, well, let's go. Let's go where, where I think we'll get to the the details about where you're at now. We'll, we'll get there. But okay. tell us about as you've been going through this process and trying to harmonize uh, politics and your faith, because you're a, a strong Christian leader, uh, committed to your church and your faith, uh, all those things, and yet um, there's this prevailing sense, it, to, it seems to me, of churches uh, wanting to avoid um, any connection to politics because of all the bad press that that would do. How did you try and uh, kind of research and harmonize uh, how, how you can be involved in politics, even though uh, your faith is so strong and you can, you can invest all your time in your church and your small group and the places that you volunteer mm -hmm. with CASA and uh, the the food bank there in your county. Uh, Goochland Cares. <laughs> Goochland Cares. You could do all that, but mm -hmm. but you decided as a Christ follower to say, no, I'm going to run and play and put my influence in that place. Um, as you were thinking through that, praying through that, and then how did God speak to you through scripture about that in particular? It's a great question. I, while I was busy doing stuff, I really saw that there was the potential, even though we're a small county, that um, we, we like to say we're a small but mighty county. We, we are the only county our size that has two AAA bond ratings, and we just got those the last eight years. And things were changing. We could, the, the current board, there's some history there that I don't get into, but there was a good, there was a very high likelihood that the positive momentum that we were seeing um, it could go the other way. And I'm always, I've always been kind of wired of one of those people that I don't like to complain about things. I like to bring solutions. Um, and we just started thinking about it. And I, and I remember telling Brent, I said, you know, we ought to think about that. She's like, no, I don't want that. You know, it's just, it's just not something that is in my personality. I don't want to be the first lady of Goochland, you know, so, um, <laughs> but we, we did spend a lot of intentional prayer time. And then, um, we did ask God specifically to affirm um, this, that I was supposed to run. Because you, you ask yourself, am I doing this because of me? Is this just my ego? Or is this, is this really what you want me to do? And, and God affirmed very strongly that I was to run. I never got any sense that I was going to win. As a matter of fact, even up until the last couple of days, I, I pretty much thought I was going to lose. But, um, and I was okay with that I, because of the race I, did, I ran. Um, I am extremely apolitical. I don't, I, if you were to ask me, um, prior to running, I would have told you I was a libertarian, um, and that, you know, Hey, you, you go do your life. I'll go do mine. Um, but just something was pulling on me. And when I decided to run, I, I had to, I had to decide, was I going to run independent or Republican Democrat? And I read the Goochland Republican creed. And the first line is, it's something I, I wish I would have printed out, I should have, but it says, you know, 
we affirm our belief in God that he is the creator in over all things. And every point that they had, I completely agreed with. And when you don't have aspirations, so I think the other thing you have to understand is I have no further aspirations. You know, you and I were joking, Tim, that, you know, maybe I'll go for a state delegate or whatever. I don't have, I, I, I'm not saying that that would never happen, but when you have no, all the bad stuff that comes with politics is because people want to stay in office. I have no desire to stay in office. I'm hoping for four years and done, kind of like my Marine Corps. I did six and I was done. Um, but just to have the opportunity to to serve, and that's really what it becomes about, you know, whether I'm serving in the church, whether I'm serving in the military, having that heart of service and being able to have the confidence to know I don't have, I, 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 I I'm going to do what I believe is right because after four years, if I get voted out or if I don't even run, like there's nobody has anything hanging over my head. Um, yeah. So it, it, it got to where uh, Brennan, after the third time we prayed and God so, uh, and I, I'll tell you the three examples, they're on the next slide. Um, but there was a candidate that popped up that was supposed to be running against me for the Republican nomination. And, um, they ended up dropping out and we had no idea why um, before the, the Republican party in Virginia does not do um, primaries. So we have mass meetings and I, I didn't even know what a mass meeting was. And I asked God to, for, to not be close. Like either I really, really win or I really, really lose. And I really, really won. I think I got four times the amount of votes as the other candidate. But then there was a forum that was coming up where all the candidates were going to be there, but there were some, um, there were some issues with whether we thought it was going to be done fairly. And I was getting a lot of pressure of, are you going to do it or not? And I asked God, I said, God, just do me a favor and remove the decision. And literally within two days, the forum was canceled. So I had no, I didn't have to make the decision. So at that point, Brennan said, oh, you have to do this and you have to do it well. Um, but again, I, I think the big thing is that when, when you, when you know you can just do what you believe is right, um, that's, that's a wonderful feeling. And again, pretty much every decision I make, 50% of the people in the room don't like me. So, and that's hard for me because um, I'm, uh, I kind of like to be liked, not as much as I realize. And that's part, sort of what campaigning also teaches you. All right. Well, let's move through your slides here about the kind of this, uh, the spiritual side of it, what you've learned from the spiritual side that scripture has to say about this. And then we'll dive into the kind of the logistics of what you're learning about how churches can be involved. Yeah. Yeah. What I'd like to talk to, to everybody about tonight is, you know, is that the church is extremely important, not just in being involved, but for the candidates itself. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tim, I would say, unequivocally, I don't even have to really think about it, that running in that campaign was harder than Marine Corps boot camp, which is known to be pretty hard. And um, it's because the, the, uh, there's so much mental going on. Um, it, it, it makes you look at yourself in a way that I have never experienced before. And you truly do have to ask yourself what you believe. You have to, you have to, um, and you have to articulate that in a way that, that, um, I don't want to say it's free for people, but that people can understand. Um, you asked about my faith. I spoke more about my faith during the campaign than I ever have probably in my, in my life. Um, and it, 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 because people, that was important to people. I live in a, in a, in an area which there's a lot of, a lot of churches and faith is important to people. And being able to share that my faith was real was really important to a lot of people. Um, the part about campaigning that's tough, though, is that it hits every one of your core weaknesses. Um, my core weaknesses are, like I said, I have an unhealthy desire to be liked. People, there were people that didn't like me just because of what side of the aisle I was on. Um, I don't really react well to criticism. I had to stop going on social media because people would, people would just troll me and say things, and I'd get nasty emails and this and that, and it, it, and it really took me a lot to kind of just put that and see that for what it was. And then there's this desire to be all things to all people, which, you know, I, I, I struggled with really early on. I always said, well, I'm just going to be straightforward. The first two weeks of my campaign, I remember I was, before I fell asleep, I was laying in bed and just, just had a terrible day. 
and I wasn't sure why. And, and what it came to be was, I realized that when somebody was asking me a question, I was doing my best to find, to try to answer the question the way I thought they wanted me to answer it. And just so I wouldn't lose their vote or just that I, that I would get it. And God really uh, conflicted me and said, hey, um, no, just be, just tell the truth. Be honest. Even if they're not going to vote for you, they don't agree with you. It's about your policy and your platform. People aren't necessarily not going to vote against me unless I make it about me. They can vote against my platform, and I'm okay with that. That's why we have the system. If you don't agree with me, we should have more options. I signed every person that wanted to run. I signed all of their um, petitions to run for office because I think competition is a good thing, but we have to be educated on that. And that's what I'm hoping to do tonight is talk about, does God really even care about politics, national, local level? And then what, what should the church's response be to that, in, in my opinion? All right, well, let's dive into Let's go ahead and just dive right into that. All right. How, how have you been learning what you think about that, how God cares at all about that? I think some people would think that God wants us to stay out of that. So what, uh, what have you learned in, uh, through this process in that, on that topic? Yeah, so um, I, I have come to believe that God is, is very involved in this and, and wants us to be involved in that there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a blessing that can come upon a nation if you follow God's world. And there's a great scripture that um, I do also want to say, uh, I heard it the day before the election, we had a prayer service and a pastor from the central um, Virginia Assemblies of God came and spoke. And he, and so a lot of what I'm talking about, I learned from him. Um, his name is Pastor Bernie Newcomb. Just want to uh, give him a shout out that, you know, it was very powerful. And there's, I was so naive. You know, I was a I was a history buff. I, I, I thought I wanted to go into politics, but I didn't realize how hard it was to set up this great experiment that is the United States. Um, and that it is only, and again, uh, I think hopefully this audience would agree, but it is only with God that we could have what we have. And we have to fight very hard to hold on to it. Um, and and that's, that's really why I wanted to spend some time tonight. But if you, if you want to go to the... All right. Deuteronomy, Tim, uh, I think this is a great scripture of what it kind of talks about the blessing that God gives and, you know, the risk of not following that blessing. So in verse 28, right. if you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord, your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Your crops of your land, the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to and the Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as a, his holy people as he promised you on oath. That's big word right? You don't, hear, you don't really hear about God giving you an oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience with him, then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you a abundant prosperity in the fruit of the womb, the young of the livestock, and the crops of your ground, and the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and bless all the works of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you this day and carefully follow them. You will always be at the top, never at the bottom, do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or the left, following other gods and serving them. That's the blessing. And then, of course, there's the however. And y'all know when, um, when God says, but, or however, something's coming. If you don't uh -huh. obey the Lord your God, you will uh, do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today. All these curses will come and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city, cursed in the county. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. The crops in your land, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send you send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done forsaking him. 
The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, scorching heat. And it goes on uh, for quite a while. Uh, I'll just kind of skip ahead and, and finish up. The Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring on you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded. So there's an option. There's a choice here. Are you going to follow the Lord and are you going to do what he believes is right? And are you going to be just or are you going to sin, be sinful and, and not follow what the Lord does? And that's going to be a huge, that, that's what blesses a nation. Psalms 1434 says, righteous exalts the nation, but sin condemns any people. So, you know, we can have a strong economy, but a strong economy is not going to exalt a nation. We, we do need strong borders. A strong borders aren't going to exalt the nation. We need a strong army for protection, but a strong army is not going to exalt it. Only righteousness exalts a nation. And I think what's fascinating to me, Tim, is that our founding fathers figured this out, and they knew that. They believe, they, they, I just can't even imagine. You know, we're in this, we're redoing government. I'm redoing government on a daily basis now because of this pandemic. We're trying to figure out, we're passing emergency ordinances. We're trying to figure out how to, to function in a government that's been going well for hundreds of years. Our founding fathers had to sit down and figure out how are we gonna do, build something that sticks? And they could have done it a couple different ways. They could have said, as I think a lot of us today do, I, I know I do it, I'm like, hey, why reinvent the wheel? Let's just, let's take what was there. Well, they had two choices, right? You could have government that was set up to follow ethnicity or tribal simil similar people. So the French, German, Japanese, Greek, that sort of model where people that looked like you, felt like you, talked like you were similar and formed a nation. Or you had a disparate group with strong leaders. So if you think of the empires and the, that had gone around conquering people and, and ruled with heavy, with heavy hands, well, they had the, the founding fathers looked at it and said, well, I don't think we like any of those options. So they said, you know what? We're going to form the United States and it's going to be a nation that isn't formed by ethnicity, tribal similarity, or authoritarian rule or monarchies. It's, it's about an idea, and an idea that liberty to govern oneself is the core to human existence. And that is hard. Um, we saw it when Saddam Hussein fell and Iraq fell. Um, I served in, in, the, in the first Gulf War, and I know that our President Bush believed that if he just went in freedom, everything would be fine. And it's still a mess, because being free is hard. Um, if you go to the next slide, you yeah. know, the founding fathers had to make a conclusion. They knew man was fallen, but that man could be redeemed. So how do you form a government that allows people to be free? Because free people unto themselves aren't going to do really well. There's no reason for me to give to you or to be generous or to not take from, from the weak. In, in um, Eric Metex's book, if, if You Can Keep It, he talks about the founding fathers believed the role of government wasn't to build health systems. It wasn't to do anything other than to protect the weak from the strong. And I think that, I think there's some merit to that. So when you look at, there's a, a great chart that I want to share with you um, that um, Oz Guinness put together and it's called the golden triangle of freedom. So if you want liberty, liberty requires virtue. Where does virtue come from? If I see somebody with more and I'm stronger than them, why don't I just go take it? Like, what's what's in it for me? Like, why wouldn't I? How do you how does it, how do you come to morality? If you if you're going to be virtuous, if you're going to be moral, you need some sort of guiding principle to do that, and that's where religion and faith comes in. So the founding fathers knew for this great experiment to happen, it was going to come from being to be free that you needed virtue but at the core of it was faith and religion and a lot of people you'll talk about and you'll hear about wait a minute what about separation of church from state that you know that, that was that, isn't that in the constitution no that's not that's actually not even in any government document whatsoever it was a letter that was written to a church 
because the church was afraid of the government impeding on religion. I, th I think it's fascinating that fast forward hundreds of years, and now it's the government that's afraid of the church invading. That just blows my mind. Let that, let that sink in for a second. The, in the, when the country was formed, the fear was that, hey, the government is going to infringe on our religion. You know, because all over the world, there were, there were countries that were Christian, but it was because they were mandated to be Christian. You know, they were Muslim because they were mandated to be Muslim. The founding father says, that's not what we want. And the government is not going to infringe on that. And if you look today, the, the, the government is afraid of religion. So, you'll, and that's why we wind up in the situation we're in. There's a great um, French uh, philosopher that um, has one of the greatest quotes. Um, I apologize. I know I'm reading a lot. I typically wouldn't, but these things are written so much better than I could ever articulate them. So I, I, I just ask you to bear with me. But, well, yeah. Neil, I'm going to interrupt you real quick, and, and then we want you to dive in real quick. That book that you referred to uh, will be included in the resources tomorrow, as well as the slides in PDF form for those that would like that. But uh, awesome. jump right through this, and then we'll jump into the the uh, the uh, applications for today. Okay, great. So, Alex Day, I don't, I can't say his last name, Tocqueville. Tocqueville. Yeah, um, know, yeah. he, 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 he has a lot of writings, actually, and he was fascinated. He was from France, but he was fascinated at how this America could possibly be so great. Like, it just didn't make sense to him. So he, I, I do love this. I, I'm going to start on the, the one on the bottom right. He said, in France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freezen, freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found they were intimately united and they reigned in common over the same country. So pretty interesting. And this is just amazing. And for folks that are, who've given their lives, like I'm, I'm sure most of the people have to serve the Lord and to serve churches, you should really, you should really appreciate this observation. He says, I sought for the greatness and the genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers. And it wasn't there. I sought for her greatness in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and the genius of America in her rich minds and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. It was not in her democratic Congress or her matchless constitution, and it, it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. And it doesn't get any better than that. Good stuff right there. Yeah, <laughs> that is good stuff. I don't know if I'm on video, but mic drop. You know. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> there you go. That's, um, that's some good stuff. So, you know, like a lot of people will, will question, you know, well, how many founding fathers were actually ministers? How many of them were, were um, uh, pastors, et cetera? And, I, and there was, an, there's a, in 1864, U.S. Congress was struggling with um, having uh, clergy in the military and on the, in Congress. And um, there was a year-long study done. Uh, and, and in that study, one of the things that, the, that they decided was that, yes, in fact, there, there was every intention in the world to have God, a Christian God, involved in America. And one of the examples he uses, and it's in the book, um, if you can keep it, that Tim will share, is the uh, Benjamin Franklin. Um, so imagine here you are, you're under persecution, you're, you've just won the American Revolution, and you're like, okay, great, now what do we do? And Benjamin Franklin, and, and you've spent, you're close to 100 days arguing about what kind of country we're going to have. You know, are the House and Senate, are they based on population or is one should be one just have a certain number? And, you know, what are the slaves rights? What are landowners? Rights? What are the government's rights? And all with this back thinking or this thought of we just came from a tyrannical society. and We want to make sure that um, that doesn't happen again. But they the the uh, Congress, the the convention was going worse and worse. Instead of getting better and better, it went worse and worse. And one morning, um, Benjamin Franklin gets up and he gives this uh, speech to the president of the, the, the convention. He says, I'm going to read this from the, from the book. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, 
is scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us. How has it happened? Sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding. Now, you have to understand, historically, um, now, first off, Benjamin Franklin was 81 years old when he was at this, so he served way late in, in his time, but he also um, was probably the least religious, if you would. Him and, I think they go back and forth, and him and Jefferson, who was the least religious? So this, he wasn't a pavy, he wasn't known for, you know, really being, a, you know, speaking from the pulpit. But he says, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. To that kind of providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national facility, felicity. And, I have, and have we forgotten that? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire can rise, it is improbable that an empire can rise without his aid. We have been assured, sir, in his sacred writings that except the Lord built the house of the labor they built in it. I firmly believe this, and I believe that without his concurring and aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interests, our projects will be confounded, and ourselves shall be become a reproach and by word down future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter, from this unfortunate instance, despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed with our business. Tim and I were, um, I was getting a text prior to the meeting and it was the chairman of our board. We were meeting tomorrow to review what the coronavirus, the impacts are gonna be. And she texted me, she had asked me if I would pray um, on the dais. Every, every time we have a formal meeting, we invite a pastor in um, to pray. And um, when we don't have a formal one, so far 100% of the time I've been asked. And that, that, that means something to me. The fact that people see my faith and, and say, hey, will you be the one to pray over this body and for God's wisdom as we move forward? Um, but there you go. So you've got Benjamin Franklin standing up and saying, hey, we're not going to get a constitution unless we bring God into this. So I don't know how anybody can argue about separation of church and state. I just don't see it. All right. Well, let's transition now to the time that we've got left to uh, make it a case kind of biblically and historically about, yes, the, the church is very appropriate to include our faith in politics from its very foundation of our country. So for what you've learned in the last 90 days as now a professional politician, how can churches, the average church, uh, be uh, interacting with their local politics in positive ways that also strike a balance to where it doesn't cross the line to the to the bad stories we hear that make the the government want to stay away from the church what are some of the positive ways that you've seen that church can really be uh involved in just local politics like uh now you're a su county supervisor there are how many supervisors for your county yeah so I'll, maybe I'll put it. so there's five supervisors for our county and it, mm -hmm. it'd be akin to a city council and then we have a county administrator who we, who we appoint um, that would sort of be like an elected mayor. So the, the, the administrator runs the staff on a daily basis. We pretty much, we write the ordinances and the laws, we set the budgets, and then we, um, and then we, um, any variances for planning and ordinances and things like that, we, we deal with. Um, so- I think that's one of the misconceptions that I that I have about local politics, being a math person, is we hear the national politics and we watch on election night and, you know, the general election, there were 65 million votes for each of the two candidates, practically speaking. And local politics, you don't need 65 million votes to have a person of faith sitting in a seat of significant influence for your local mm -hmm. community, your county. 
uh, how many votes does it take to get elected, at least in your small county, uh, to, to be supervising what's going on there? When I went into this, I thought I needed about 750 votes to just based on number of registered voters, turnout, da 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 da, da looking historically. I ended up getting 1,045, um, and I did win, we had the highest turnout per capita in Virginia. Um, our, count, our county, and my district specifically, is pretty active. Um, but there are so many ways that the, the church can and, and arguably should be involved. Um, and, and the thing that's nice about it, it's not hard. And it's very welcome from the, the local officials, the, at least the ones that I've, I've run into. You know, I, I do think Goochland is special, but I do believe that um, when you have people coming with a heart of wanting to make things better and not just complain, <laughs> believe me, I'm, you know, I'm sure no pastors know anything about that. Um, <laughs> Never. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think what I think the challenge is, is there's the, there is this. It's not a misconception because it was it's deliberate that you know the in, there's law, there was laws passed that you, the churches can lose their 501c3 if they are seen as supporting a candidate specifically, um, and that's that's just a travesty. And President Trump um, has he ran on abolishing that rule. Um, he hasn't yet. Although he has put out a executive order that directs the treasury not to take any action, but there's a lot of debate on whether or not that that's good um, or, or if that really is even worth the paper it's written on. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction, mm -hmm. but even from being able to say, okay, Neil's running from our church, you know, we're going to support Neil. Um, I think I think people need to understand what the church believes and what the values are. And I hope I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, but it's sort of in my experience that we're so worried about offending people that um, it's difficult. And, and we're I don't say we're afraid to stand on truth, but we you know we, we just don't want any we, we don't want to upset anybody. We, we, so we we kind of stay I don't know very vanilla and just kind of keep things where you can. You can bring people, um, let pick the church, your church, your people should know what your church believes and whether they're local things um, or even on a national level. And I've always argued because maybe because my grandfather was in the school board that you, my life is impacted more on a daily basis by my local government than on the federal or state. And, um, and no let me actually, interrupt you and go ahead. Yeah, clarify for me when you say know what you believe. So, for example, they need to know that you, your church values what kinds of things that you can be really clear about. Well, I think, I think the role of government, you know, I, I, that, that's a big one I get asked a lot. What, and I, I wrestle with, which is what should government be doing for us? Um, I remember, was it Sandy? Tim, or, her, or, or maybe it was Hurricane Katrina. And the government swept in and just offloaded all this money. Or even with the Great Recession, you know, the government's sweeping in and saving everybody. It kind of almost takes the wind out of the church's sails. And the, the church isn't, a, you know, and so you can influence how how much your government gets involved. Um, I'm getting questions now about all the time. Well, what is what is your county doing for the people right now? And I, I believe government is supposed to come alongside the people and help them remove robots and barriers that the government has already placed there. Um, but to know like, okay, we believe that the, ch the church's role is to help the people and the, the local schools are feeding everybody. And I wasn't aware that, and, and it's the entire county, but you can argue. You can argue. Is that the right thing for the schools to be doing or not? Like, should local churches be stepping up? Should food pantries be stepping up? Or, or, or what? What is the role of government? Um, because it all comes down to tax dollars, and knowing where the church stands on those things, um, I, I think is important. But also just knowing who your government officials are, because on our docket, the things I'm voting on, I would say half of them have to do with churches. There's a church, the uh, Chinese Baptist church here that wants to put an addition on. Um, we just approved, this, this may be funny, but just a few months ago, the ability to have lighted signs. 
um, and the video signs in the county. Um, so churches are applying to have the lit signs. Um, there was another church that, I forget what they want to do, but we're interacting with the churches all the time because they're in our county and we actually have a, quite a lot of them. Um, but they, they need stuff or they need variances from us and having those relationships make it, make it important. All right, so let's go through the list that you gave me of some real practical ways that churches can be interfacing with their local politicians. Absolutely. Uh, and let me get to that slide there. All right, to kind of finish this up here. I forgot to share screen. Hold on. I do that all the time. There we go. Okay, so, so we you already talked about the first and for, you already got the first one is just just let the your po local politicians know what what you're about as a church, what you believe in. Yeah, and let, you, right. let your and, and, and have that conversation amongst your congregation too. Um, be involved in your government, and it's not hard. It, it's 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 actually a lot easier than you think. Um, somebody from your church should be going to the meetings. They're making decisions about things that impact your people and your congregation. We should know what those things are. Um, ask to open the session in prayer. I don't know if every county opens their sessions with prayer, but ours does. And like I said, every formal meeting, a local pastor is coming and praying for the for the um, the board, uh, and asking for God's wisdom. And I, I I love that. I need that. Um, and then build relationship with the leaders. You know, I don't know of any uh, local politician, especially that doesn't want to hear from their constituents. I, the first question, people ask me all the time, well, what do you think about this issue? And like, I flip it around immediately. I'm like, it's not what I think. We have a, we have a democratic republic. Like, I represent you, I'm your advocate. What do you think? Um, so having those relationships is important. Um, include inform, inf information about important issues in your communications. You know, when, when we're voting on prayer in school or, you know, maybe not even, but there, there are things that we care about from a faith perspective that you should let your people, your congregations know, here's what your local government is considering. And, you know, you have a voice into this. Um, this one was a little surprising to me, but it was super effective. Hold a forum or debate. Um, there are races every four years for supervisors in Virginia. And I know we probably have some folks from out of Virginia, so I apologize. I don't, I don't, know the laws outside of them i'm trying to learn my own um but you know every two years there is a there's a race for congress um, offer the local parties both parties to hold a forum or debate uh, every forum i and debate i went to was in a church except with the exception of one which is in the high school so it is a and then the churches that do it um they show up as great hosts people come to visit them afterwards, they may have never gone to that church. So it's a, it's a great way to reach your community and an outreach. Plus it lets your congregation hear for themselves from the candidates. And you don't have to say which candidate or which party you're supporting. And people will say, well, what if, what if there's a super, super crazy liberal? Uh, and I've always believed that, you know, faith stands on truth and truth will win and come out every time. So I don't think it's anything you need to be afraid of. Uh, what else do we have? Invite the candidates to visit your church. I was invited to several of my local churches. I, I, I would tell them I'm not interested in getting up and speaking. This is the time for your congregation to worship God, not to hear from a politician. But I will stand in the back afterwards and people can ask me questions. And I, I went to several uh, churches like that. Um, and again, encourage your congregation to be involved, to vote, donate, and support. Um, uh, I was... It, it's crazy how much money comes into this and you don't want it to, but you can see, I put a couple of my signs um, right behind me. Not so much because, you know, I, I do think they're good looking signs, but they're also like 45 bucks a piece. You know, and I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't have deep pockets, but supporting not just your local candidates, like there's a lot of races around Virginia that are important so that we can build up the, um, the delegates and the Senate, the way that support our beliefs. And if it, even if you're winning your race or your local, if somebody else isn't, that you may want to think about supporting them. And I don't think people realize that like, oh, Goochland was good. Well, Goochland was good, but we lost the entire state of Virginia. So 
there was there, there was some need some other places. Um, encouraged believers, you know, I never thought I was going to run for office. Um, seemed like the furthest thing from my mind, but there are people that you know that are good leaders, and what, and if, and especially if they've come up through leading in the church, what a better person to have representing you and your congregation in a public office, and encourage that um, whenever you can. Um, it's again, it is the hardest thing I've ever done, and having uh, church support. And just knowing, and even, and I didn't put it on here because it's kind of like the, the Sunday school answer, every answer is Jesus, but pray. I mean, you got to pray for your, for your candidates and your government. Um, and it does, it does matter. And it, it, it's the only thing that got me through it, to be completely honest. Well, those are some great advice. I think most churches are, are trying to stay away from politics, but actually to invite politics so that we can have, have express we're citizens as much as anyone else. So why exactly. shouldn't we, why shouldn't our values that would include faith values be shared with our politicians rather than a distance where we're strangers. And so I think that's huge. All those ways that you shared with us that we could uh, do that. And then, and then to actually run, uh, you know, I asked you earlier of your five supervisors, how many would you say are people of faith? And at least in Goodson County, it is. It's every one of them. Every one of them, you know, and what if every county in Virginia or Maryland or North Carolina, whoever's on our webinar today, that all of their uh, local uh, political leaders were people of faith, uh, at least they would represent uh, broadly the, all of their citizens, but they would share faith values uh, that would be similar to ours. Well, uh, Neil, I think this is so, so fascinating. Thank you for running for office. And then uh, I'm glad that you ran a, a campaign that would allow you to win so that you would have influence in your county for the next four years and that you can share your, uh, your, what you've learned about that, uh, even with us here early in, three months in, about how there's a historical foundation for it with our country uh, needing to be based, having people of faith uh, in critical spaces has been part of it from the very beginning, as well as uh, a, a biblical uh, mandate for us to be involved in influencing uh, our, our leaders uh, with our faith values. And so uh, I would encourage everyone that's on this uh, webinar uh, tonight to think about how they could involve their church uh, by being uh, relationally connected with your local leaders. And so, uh, so thanks for that. Uh, our time is just about up. I want to take just a couple of minutes to tell you about upcoming webinars. And those people that are today on a webinar, this may not be for you, but you know the person at your church that is going to be most interested in, uh, in uh, these, these upcoming webinars. So uh, next month, uh, in the month of March or May, uh, we're going to be, be meeting, talking with uh, some churches that have uh, were in vulnerable situations that called churches in a better footing to say, hey, well, what would happen if we talked about merging our two congregations? And there's going to be a lot of churches in our region that ought to have that conversation. And so hear from two leaders that they were the more fragile congregations that took the assertive step of making the phone call to ask for help. And then the next one's very fascinating is about the minister's office hours and how elders uh, think about that and should be overseeing kind of a new reality. We're seeing right now during the coronavirus that the minister can really be leading his church pastorally without being in the church building all the time. And so how does that work? And so we're going to hear from an elder and a minister that have worked through that over the last year and what and how they've, uh, they've come to an agreement on where they land on all that. So that'll be good stuff. Again, I also always want to give thanks to our ministry partner, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, for hosting our webinar series so that we can bring great uh, panelists like Neil to just uh, tell us how we can really make a difference as Christian leaders in our churches. Uh, often it's in within our particular area of ministry, but here it's within our community by supporting our leaders, letting them know what we value, and also by becoming leaders in our community, not just our church. So thank you for your time tonight. You will get an email uh, follow-up uh, that will give you some of those resources and slides that Neil shared tonight. Uh, but we hope you become an influence in your community uh, because to be, to be a great country, our country has to be founded on uh, the, the Christian values that give us the morality to really uh, hold our freedom together. And so thanks for sharing that, Neil. I think that's great stuff. So everyone have a great evening, and we hope to see you and some of your friends on an upcoming webinar. Have a great evening.